Let us pray. Father, we thank you for today, Lord, for today is your day, Lord. Father, you have made it so that we can rejoice and be glad in it, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Father, Lord, for your presence in here, Lord. Thank you, Holy Spirit. We give you all the glory and all the honor. I pray, Lord, that as I speak, that you will speak through me, Lord, in Jesus' name, Lord. Speak through me, Father, I pray. I pray that I'll be your vessel, Lord. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. The title of the message I've got today, my brothers and sisters, is Kingdom Living. You know, how do you live a life of the kingdom of heaven? How do you live that life? You know, Jesus is the greatest example. You know, Jesus you know, gave us many examples because he preached nothing but the kingdom of God. Jesus said in Luke chapter 6, verses 28 to 30, Bless them that curse you, and pray for them which despitefully use you. And unto him that smit thee on one cheek, offer also the other, and let him that taketh away the cloak forbid not to take thy um, coat also. So, so I'll stop at 28 for now. You know, so Christ is saying, bless those that curse you. you no, know, this is kingdom living. You know, bless those that curse you. You know, one thing with um, the Lord is that Christ is spirit and those who worship Christ, or those who serve him, must serve him in spirit, not in flesh. You know, the flesh will want to say to you, you know, like anybody that curses you, you curse them back. Now, that is what the flesh wants. And if somebody says something to you, say it back to them. You know, show them that you have the upper hand. You know, if anybody that smikes you on one cheek, you know, before, you know, when they smike you, you smite them back. You know, it's called self-defense. You know, that is what the world, you know, wants us to believe. You know, even before they smack, uh, they smack you, you know, smack them to avoid them smacking you. But Christ is saying, no, the kingdom living is to live a life that is worthy to God, a life that glorifies God. You know, if people say things that are hurtful, you know, it's very easy for us to give, uh, give them a piece of our mind. Christ is saying, no, it's not the way. You know, the tongue is very dangerous. You know, the tongue can set a lot of things on fire. You know, the tongue has got the power of life and death. And this is the reason why Christ is saying to us, when somebody curses you, pray for them. You know, use your tongue to bless them rather than to curse them. Because give them the life, you know, that comes from the tongue. Because Christ is life. You know, verse 30 Verse 30 says, Give to every man that asketh of thee, and of him that taketh away thy goods, ask them not again. You know, the kingdom living is to give to all that ask. You know, like, one thing is to give. You know, there are people that will give to people. They give people with the expectation that they'll get something in return. It's not the life that Christ, why not? Like, remember I did this for you? Remember I gave you this? Now it's your turn to repay me back. No, Christ is saying, no, give to all who ask. Give to all who ask. You know, one thing with Christ is that Christ gave it all for us. Do you know that every healing that Christ gave, he never asked for it in return. Every gift that Christ gave was free. No, he gave it all for us. Even his death on the cross was free. He didn't ask for anybody to die again on the cross. No, but he died once for all. Now Christ is saying when you give, the best giving actually is to give to someone that you know that will never repay you back. You know, that is the best giving. Not to give to someone. You know, when you give to someone that, already, that has already got it, you know, you're, it's not really a gift. You know, because you know you're just giving for the sake of it. But when you give to someone that will not ask for it in return, that you know that will never, when that person asks and you give that person, knowing that that person will never pay you back, 
That is the life that Christ wants us to live. Because Christ, you know, when he gave healing, he knew that nobody could heal themselves. He knew that he was the only one that could heal. He knew that he was the only one that could set people free. Now, this is the type of life that Christ is saying to us, live this life. Live this life here, the, um, the life that glorifies God. Now, we have to remember that, you know, the Bible says that that which is born of the flesh is flesh. And that which is born of the spirit is spirit. You know, when you give, you know, you're living the life of a spirit. You now you have to remember that flesh has its own desire. You know, flesh only lives for, um, for a moment, but the spirit lives for eternity. So the question is, which one do you want to satisfy? You now, do you want to satisfy the lust of the flesh? Or do you want to live the life of a spirit? You know, the spirit and the flesh may be, you know, now we'll live up to 100 years. Or maybe up to 110, you know, if science have their way. You know, the, but the flesh, one thing with the flesh is that it's destined to die, you know, whether we like it or not. But our spirit will live forever. Our spirit will never die. You know, so what life do we want to live? Is it a life that glorifies God? You know, the life of spirit. You know, one thing is that you don't want to be rewarded here on earth. You know, it's... Um, you know, it's one thing to be rewarded, but it's not really, really the reward we want. You know, the reward we want is the reward of eternity. You know, the reward that will live. You know, eternity has no end. You know, you're living and you're enjoying that reward. And that reward can only come from God. Now, this is the reason why Jesus, you know, preached nothing but the kingdom of God. You know, I always love this verse, um, Luke 4, 43. You know, when Jesus started his ministry, you know, he said, and he said unto them, I must preach the kingdom of God to other cities also, for therefore I am sent. You now, for this reason, you know, Christ was sent, so that, you know, we can live that eternity with him. You know, when Christ used the word, I must preach the kingdom of God. For this reason, he was sent. That must is the key. You know, that must shows that he has to do it. He has to show us the way. Because Christ is the way. He's the only way to God. Nobody knows the way to God. So if you want to live that eternal life, you have to live a life that glorifies God. You know, you have to live a life that will give you that reward, you know, for eternity. Because the flesh will only last for so long. You know, when you say that you belong, in God, when you belong to God, when you say that you're a true believer, you know, one thing happens. People look at you. People look at your behavior. How are you living your life? Is your life glorifying God? Is everything that you're doing giving God the glory? You know, because you become a light. You know, when you say, I'm a believer in Christ. My life, I live just to glorify God. All eyes on you, you know, whether you like it or not. You know, we started in the book of Romans, how believers, when you believe in God, you know, people are looking at you. Unbelievers are looking at you. And when they are looking at you, you're representing God. If your life does not glorify God, one thing that will happen is that unbelievers will begin to blaspheme the name of God. Now, this is our current study, you know, in the book of Romans. So if we read on Romans um, 2, 21 to 24, this is what happens, you know, when we say that we are living the life that glorifies God, but we are doing something that is contrary to the um, word of God. You know, 21 says, thou, thou therefore which teaches another, teachest not thyself. Thou that preachest a man should not steal, dost thou steal? Thou that says a man should not commit adultery, does that commit adultery? Thou that abhors idol, does that commit sacrilege? Thou that makes, makest thy boast of the law through the breaking of the law, dishonoreth thy God? For the name of God is blasphemed among the Gentiles through you, as is written. 
So when people, you know, when you say that you're in God and you're saying you cannot do this, you cannot do that, you have to live the right life. People are looking at you to see what your behavior is like. Because action speaks louder than words. You know, some people love to say it, but they cannot do it. You know, some people say you cannot steal, but they are stealing. You know, for example, you know, like in some workplaces, you know, there are things that, that belong to the organization. And you have people that will take it and say, oh, well, you know, it doesn't matter, you know, like nobody, you know, it's, it's, it's kind of mine. But it's not yours, it belongs to the organization. If an unbeliever is doing that, and you who are in Christ are doing the same thing that the unbeliever is doing, one thing that happens is that the unbeliever will say, wow, I know that I don't believe in God. You that believe in God, you are doing the same thing as I am. You know, you preach that don't steal, but you are stealing. You know, so when they say that, they'll say, why do I have to believe in God? What kind of God do you serve? You know, you serve a God, but yet you steal. You serve a God, but yet you clearly tell lies. It doesn't live the life that glorifies God. And this is the reason why, you know, people will end up blaspheming the name of God. You know, when we live the life that glorifies God, that life must show to the people around us. You know, because we are light. You know, when you're in Christ, you are light and that light must shine bright so that the name of God must be glorified. The Spirit of God in us will cause the name of God, you know, to be glorified. You know, the Holy Spirit is very important. You know, He's the Spirit of truth. You know, the Spirit of life. You know, as I said before, you know, um, in my last time preaching, you know, a man <coughs> without the Spirit of God or a woman without the Spirit of God cannot represent God here on earth. It's impossible. You know, if the Spirit of God is in you, you can represent God. But if the Spirit of God is not in you, you cannot represent God here on earth. That person cannot represent God here on earth. You know, there are some examples, and I love this example. You know, it's in the book of Acts. You know, Paul was a great example of someone that the Spirit of God was in, and he was representing God, you know, when he lived his life here on earth. You know, he went around to many cities, you know, teaching about the Word of God, you know, preaching nothing but the kingdom of God. You know, so when we read Acts, chapter 13, verse 2, it says, as they ministered to the Lord and fasted, the Holy Ghost said, separate me, Barnabas and Saul, for the work whereunto I have called them. So you can see here, the Holy Spirit have said, separate for me, Barnabas and Saul. You know, so he has, a, you know, he has said, these two are going to represent me here on earth. You know, so as we read on, if we read um, Acts, 19 um, verses 11 and 12 you know this shows somebody that is representing God here on earth he said and God wrought special miracles by the hands of Paul so that from, so that from his body we are brought unto the sick handkerchiefs and or aprons and the diseases departed from them and the evil spirit went out from them. So this is somebody that was that is living the life of God. That even anything they have, because of the Holy Spirit in them, sickness will leave anybody that they call that they pray for. You know, it says that even the handkerchief or the aprons that they use, you know, all diseases departed from them. Even much more the evil spirit went out of them. You know, I would like to read it from the, um, from the New King James Version. It says, Now God worked unusual miracles, and I just love that word, unusual miracles by the hands of Paul, so that even the handkerchiefs or apron were brought from, the, from his body to the sick, and the disease, diseases left them, and the evil spirit went out of them. So when God is in you, when the Spirit of God is in you, you begin to do unusual things. You know, I love how the Bible said unusual 
you know, so it seems like, you know, you have, if I put it like this, you have like normal miracles and the unusual miracles. You know, the normal miracles is now you pray for somebody, you lay a hand on them and they're made well. You know, you pray for somebody and the demons are cast out. You know, the demons roar, uh, run at your sight. For me, it's just my interpretation, you know, when you say usual miracle, but the unusual miracle is when God begins to work wonders through you that even any object that, is, that belongs to you, when sickness sees it, because of the Holy Spirit in you, that sickness will see it and run away. Even the evil spirits, when they see anything that belongs to you, because of the Spirit of God in you, the evil spirit, you know, I like how he said, he said, evil spirits went out of them. So not just one spirit running, but there are many spirits running away because of what God would do when the Spirit of God is in you, because you're representing God, you know, here on earth. You know, as I mentioned before, a person without the Spirit of God cannot represent God here on earth. You know, we know this story well. You know, it's about the sons of Sceva. <laughs> you know, if we read Acts 19, you know, from 13 to 16, it said, then, a, then certain of the vagabond Jews exorcists took it upon um, them to call over them which had evil spirits the name of the Lord Jesus, saying, We adjure you by Jesus whom Paul preaches. And there were seven sons of, Sk of one Sceva, a Jew, and a chief priest of the priest, which did so. And the evil spirit answered and said, Jesus I know, and Paul I know, but who are you? And the man in whom the evil spirit was leaped on, leaped on them, and overcome them, and prevailed against them, so that they fled out of the house, naked and wounded. A person without the Spirit of God cannot represent God. The evil spirit, they know, they know who the Holy Spirit is in. You know, when the sons of Sceva said, we cast you out in the name of that Jesus that Paul um, preaches, they don't know God. The Holy Spirit said, I don't know who you are. So they try to cast out a demon. The demons, you have to remember, the battle we fight is in the battle of, in the spirit. So the demons are spirit. So they looked and said, hmm, I can't say the spirit of God in you. The Holy One is not in you. How dare you try to represent him? You know, you are fake. You know, as we know, you know, like he said that he beat them. You know, you can imagine seven people, one person getting hold of seven people, that when he beat them, they ran out naked and wounded. So he humiliated them because the spirit of God was not in them. You know? And this is one thing. It is dangerous you know, for somebody to prophesy that the spirit of God is in them and they try and go and cast out a demon. They see all. But guess what? When the spirit of God is in you, you are able to do mighty things. You are able to move mountains. You are able to do unusual miracles because that is how God works. The sons of Sceva could not represent God because they didn't have any authority. They didn't have any authority at all. You know, they tried to bind on earth what they couldn't bind in heaven. They couldn't lose on earth what they couldn't lose in, um, in heaven. But for us, you know, the Bible says that when the Spirit of God is in you, you can bind on earth. And when you bind it on earth, it's bound in heaven. And when you lose it here on earth, Guess what? Heaven say yes, I know you, because the Holy Spirit is in you, and you will lose it in heaven. And this is the power, you know, when the Spirit of God is in us. You know, one thing I love about the Holy Spirit is that he intercedes on our behalf. You know, sometimes when we think that we know, you know, when we begin to pray, we think that we know what we're praying for. The Holy Spirit is the one that actually prays on our behalf. And that is the great joy of having the Holy Spirit in us. Romans 8, 26 to 27. 
Romans it says, likewise, the Spirit also helpeth our infirmities, for we know not what we should pray for as we ought, but the Spirit itself maketh intercession for us with groaning, which cannot be uttered. And he searcheth the heart, knoweth that what is in the mind of the Spirit, because he maketh intercession for the saints according to the will of God. So the Spirit of God in us is the one that prays on our behalf. When we begin to pray, you know, sometimes we think that we know what we're praying for, but the Holy Spirit will say, I know you better than you know yourself. Because I'm in you, I'm even going to pray prayers that you haven't even thought of. Because he has already searched our heart. He knows everything that is in us. And he begins to make intercession on our behalf. You know, so we thank God you know, for his spirit. You know, because it's not by our might. It's not by our power. It's but by the Spirit, you know, says the Lord. So we thank God for the Holy Spirit. You know, you have to remember, Jesus' main goal was to bring the Holy Spirit into each and every one of us. That was his main goal. His death on the cross was to clean us. His death on the cross was for his blood to wash us so that the Holy Spirit can come into each and every one of us. If you're not blood washed, the Spirit cannot enter. The sons of Sceva were not blood washed. So the Holy Spirit could not enter into them and they could not represent God. Paul, on the other hand, was blood washed. And he was able to represent God. So the main goal of Jesus was to bring the Holy Spirit in each and every one of us. You know, Calvary's death did it all for each and every one of us. You know, because of his death on Calvary, now we can enter the throne room of grace because of the Holy Spirit in us. The Holy Spirit creates that direct link to heaven so that we can enter into the throne room of grace and ask God in time of need. In our you know, the, um, the sons of Sceva, they didn't have the Holy Spirit in them, so they couldn't enter the um, throne of grace. Everything they did, they didn't have access but Paul had access to the throne of grace and he was able to ask in the time of need. Now I can just imagine, because Paul had access, everything around Paul had access to the throne of grace. Now that is the reason why Christ died for each and every one of us, so that his Holy Spirit can be in each and every one of us, so that the Holy Spirit can make intercession when we're praying. Because sometimes, you know, when when we are asking God, the problem is that when we are asking God, we can ask God, but we limit God on what we ask God. And the Holy Spirit will say, no, you need to be asking for this. And I will now need to pray for your behalf. Because he is God. He is the mighty God. You know, we have to remember when we ask God, we have to believe with all our, all our heart. You know, it is impossible to ask God and not believe. You can only Please God by faith. That is the only thing that matters. You know, Hebrews 11.6 says that. But without faith, it is impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is. And that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. So when you ask in God, you must believe, you must have faith in everything that you do. You can never lose heart. You know, when you pray, you have to know that God is more than able to do it for each and every one of us. You know, because he's the mighty God. You know, Jesus um, started off in the, um, in the parable of the persistent widow. You know, he started off by saying, never lose heart when you pray. You know, when you're praying, never lose heart. This is where faith comes in. Because faith is believing that God is more than able to do it for each and every one of us. You know, so um, Luke 18, 1, you know, Jesus said, and he spoke a parable unto them to this end, that men all ought always to pray and never faint, never lose heart. Always believe that God is more than able 
to do everything that you have asked for him if it's according to his will now you have to remember it has to be the will of God you know when you're praying and God is more than able to do it never ever limit God you know when you're praying you know the God we serve is a God that is of no limit is limitless you know the problem is like is that we pray with a limited mind but when we pray we have to remember that the God that we're praying to is limitless you know with God all things are possible you know that is the God that we serve you know if you look at the children of Israel when they were in the desert you know they were eating nothing but manna forgetting that God was the one providing for them in a dry place in a desert place and they were eating they were eating but the problem is that sometimes when people eat they no longer appreciate God and they start looking for other things you know so the people of um, the children of Israel you know began uh, complaining to Moses that they're only eating manna you know like how come we've been eating this for too long you know we want something else you know we want to eat what we ate in Egypt you know we want to eat meat you know, so I can just imagine that frustration of Moses. And, you know, like at that point in time, you know, Moses thought like a human. He's a human just like each and every one of us. You know, so, you know, they were saying, we want to eat meat. We want to eat meat. We're only eating nothing but this manna. And Moses said, oh, you know, out of frustration, he went to God and he complained to God. You know, that this is what the people of Israel are saying. You know, they want to eat something else, not not the bread of life that he has given them. And God, when Moses spoke to God, he complained. And God wasn't happy, you know, with the way Moses spoke. Moses forgot that God has already used him for many miracles, for many wondrous work. You know, they've already crossed um, through the river, through the um, Red Sea. You know, God has spoken to him. He has done many mighty works through his hand. But at that point in time, Moses limited God to what God can do. And just like each and every one of us, we have to be careful that we do not limit God to what God can do. You know, Numbers 11, 19 to 23, you know, shows, you know, as Moses was complaining to God, you know, Numbers 19 says, you shall not eat one day nor two days, nor five days, neither ten days, nor twenty days, but even a whole month until it comes out of your nostril and it be loathsome unto you, because that ye have despised the Lord which is among you and have wept before him, saying, Why came forth out of Egypt? And Moses said, The people among, among who I am are 600,000 footmen and thou hast said I will give them flesh that they may eat a whole month so can you just imagine this is the God that created everything you know you have to remember you know when Moses was on the Mount of Sinai God revealed everything to him you know Moses wrote the um, books you know the five books he wrote Genesis so God showed him everything that he has done and I believe he showed him even more you know this is just me believing he showed him a lot you know what a mighty God he is but at that point in time Moses began to look with a limited mind you know he was saying to God look at the number of people around me you know 6,000 footmen you know these are men only you know you have women and children and you have little children you know like younger children so Moses was now saying to God, how can you say that you can give us a meat to eat for a whole month? If we read the next verse, he said, shall the flocks and the herd be slain for them to suffice them? So this is a person now looking at what is around them. You know, how can we feed all these people? Or shall all the fish of the sea be gathered together for them to suffice them? So this is now Moses thinking with his own mind instead of looking at God. And the Lord said unto Moses, Is the Lord's hand waxed short? Thou shalt see now whether my word 
shall come to pass unto thee or not. So Moses thought with a finite mind. He forgot that the God, at that point in time, that God is infinite, is limitless in everything that he can do. And God said to him, is my hand too short that I cannot provide? I'm already amongst you and you're complaining. You have to remember the Holy Spirit is already in us. God is with us, yet we complain. And God is saying to us, you are living a life of the kingdom of heaven and you're complaining. If my, it's my hand too short that I cannot provide everything that you have asked for me. You know, the problem is that when we ask God, sometimes we, you know, as I've said, we think or we can only see so far of what's in front of us. God sees more than any of us can see. His spirit. His spirit. You know, again, you know, like when I think of the, you know, living a life of the kingdom of God. For example, in the United Kingdom, if you have to come into the UK, you have to pay a price to come into the UK. You know, you have to pay a visa price and a ticket price to come into the United Kingdom. The funny thing is that when you are outside of the UK, even if you're a citizen of the UK, you still have to pay a price to come in. You still have to pay a plane ticket to come into the UK, regardless of who you are, whether you're a citizen or if you're not a citizen. So there is a price to pay. But you know what? I thank God, my brothers and sisters, that Christ, through his death, paid for us all. Amen. That we can enter into his throne room of grace any time that we want. Any time that we want. There is no price for any of us to pay. You know, once you believe in God, you know, as I said, the Holy Spirit is that link, you know, between us and us and heaven. We can enter any time that we want. Because we have to remember that the Holy Spirit is the one interceding on our behalf. You know, Christ died for each and every one of us, for us to have that access, for us not to pay anything at all, you know, because of his death. This is the reason why Christ says that we must walk in the Spirit. Everything we do has to be in the Spirit. Our life has to glorify God. Because that is the only thing that matters. Because the reward that we are looking for is that reward that is everlasting. If you read Galatians 5, 16 to 21, it says, This I then say, walk in the spirit, and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. When you walk in the spirit all the time, the lust of the flesh is gone. No, you have no need for that. You know, one thing with the flesh is that the flesh wants to do things that is, that is contrary to the word of God. You know, the flesh, the soul is always, the, the flesh is fighting for, to get the soul for the soul to agree. And the spirit is fighting for the soul, for the soul to do the things of the spirit. And the Bible is saying to us, walk in the spirit so that we do not fulfill the lust of the flesh. For the flesh lost it against the spirit, and the spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary, the one to the other, so that you cannot do the things that you would. So there's a constant battle all the time, the flesh and the spirit fighting over. But if you are led by the spirit, you are not under the law. We thank God for that. Now the works of the flesh are, flesh are manifested, which are these, adultery, fornication, uncleanliness, lavishness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulation, wrath, strife, sedation, heresy, envy, murderers, drunkenness, reviling, and such like, of which, so like of the which I tell you before, as I've also told you in time past, that they which do such things cannot inherit the kingdom of God. 
So if we are doing the things that are against the things that, lo- that the flesh lost after, it says that we cannot inherit you know, the kingdom of God. This is the reason why we have to walk in the spirit all the time to make sure that we can inherit the kingdom that God has already promised us. You know, so if we want to walk in the spirit, you know, Galatians 5, 22 to 26 says, but the, love of, but the fruit of the spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such, there is no law. And they that are in Christ have, have crucified the flesh with the affection and lust. If we live in the spirit, let us also walk in the spirit. Now, so when we live in the spirit, you know, the fruit of the spirit is supposed to show in us. When we say that we're in Christ, people are looking to see if that fruit is showing in us. Are we long suffering when people do things to us? You know, when somebody strikes you on one cheek, or when somebody says something that you don't agree with, or says something that is spiteful to us, are you showing that fruit of the Spirit? You know, because you have to remember, you know, the enemy knows some of the law of God, but the difference is that they don't keep it. So they are now looking at you that said that you belong to God. Are you keeping that law? Are you walking in the way of God? Are you showing love? Is, is there love in you? You know, do you show people peace in times of trouble? You know, when everybody around you is worrying and panicking, are you showing them peace? Are you showing them that love that comes from God? This is the reason why the Bible says that we should walk in the Spirit in everything that we have done. Because we have to remember that Christ did one thing for us. He sealed us with the Holy Spirit. This is the gift that he gave to us. He sealed each and every one of us you know, with the Holy Spirit. Ephesians 1, 13 and 14 says, in whom, you, in, him, sorry, in whom you have also trusted after they heard the word of the truth, the gospel of, of your salvation, in whom also after they have believed, you were sealed with the Holy, uh, with that Holy Spirit of promise in which so which is the earnest of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession unto the praise of his glory so each and every one of us are sealed with the Holy Spirit you know once we believe you know once we are blood washed you know everything we do must be to the glory of God our life should glorify God. You know, we should never glorify the situation that we're in. You know, because God is the King of glory. You know, He is the only one to glorify. You know, Sister Frankie um, preached about how Isaiah, you know, when God showed Himself to Isaiah, He saw one thing and one thing only. The angels were praising God. They were just saying, Holy, Holy, Holy is the name of God. They were only glorifying God, nothing else, nothing else matters, but they just glorify God. Now one thing is that when you look in the book of Revelation, if we read um, Revelation um, 4, 8 to 11, you will see the same thing happening. They were glorifying God in the time of Isaiah. Between Isaiah and when John saw the vision, there were 700 years in between. And the angels were still glorifying God. You know, they do it day and night. They don't stop. And it says, and the four beasts had each of them six wings about him, and they were full of eyes within. And they rest not day and night, saying, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, which was and is and is to come. This is the same thing that Isaiah saw. The angels glorifying God. You know, I love it. It says day and night. I can just imagine, you know, like they see God, you know, they see the presence of God. And they say, holy is the Lord. Holy, holy, holy. Glorifying the name of God. You know, I'll say for each and every one of us, do we glorify the situation that we're in? 
do we glorify a problem or do we just glorify God? God wants us to live a life of praise, a life that gives glory to his name. You know, for us, every day the Spirit of God in each and every one of us must cause us to be saying, holy is the name of God in all situations. You know, when, you, when we wake up, we'll say, holy, holy, holy is the name of God. And before we put our head down to sleep, we keep on glorifying God. Because when you glorify God, you can never glorify the situation that is around you. So in everything that we do, I pray that the Spirit of God will cause each and every one of us to give God glory at all time. In Jesus' name, amen. Lord, Lord, we give you glory. Thank you for your Spirit in each and every one of us, Lord. I pray, Lord, that your Spirit will be evident in everything that we do, Lord. That with the life we live, Lord, we give glory to your name, Lord. Father, I pray, Lord, that we will never look at any situation that we're in, regardless of what it is. But, Father, Lord, at all times, Lord, that we will give your name glory because you're a mighty God. We thank you and we praise your holy name, Lord. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.